The needs of the major economies can have a devastating impact on rights across the other side of the globe. But spirited insistence on those rights by Indigenous communities, facilitated by an interconnected world and consumers that care about rights, can have a tangible effect on some of the world's biggest companies who then apply this supply chain pressure up the line. High in the Andes Mountains of South America is a fascinating region where snow-capped volcanoes tower over an arid landscape of desert and vast salt flats. It's got an eerie, otherworldly beauty, never forgotten by those fortunate enough to experience it. And I'm one of those fortunate people. I first visited the region over 20 years ago as a backpacker. Since then, I've been lucky enough to return many times as an author of travel guidebooks. My love of the region is intense. It's a place that thrills me. It's lodged itself somewhere deep in my soul. The region's home to an ancient indigenous culture where traditional livelihoods of llama herding, salt harvesting, and fabulous textile manufacture sustain remote, self-sufficient communities. It's a region that's got many names in indigenous languages, and in Spanish, but it's a region that's got a new nickname, the Lithium Triangle. Covering northwestern Argentina, northeastern Chile, and southwestern Bolivia, the Lithium Triangle has some 60% of global lithium reserves. Now, until relatively recently, lithium didn't get too many pulses racing. Beyond its limited application in the pharmaceutical and ceramics industries, it wasn't a major part of the global economy. But that's changed, and lithium is now a key cog in the transition towards decarbonisation and a sustainable energy future because of its role in energy storage. Now, my research here at UNSW looks at lithium extraction in order to find answers to two of the key questions that confront us in the 21st century. They both really intrigue me. Firstly, we need to achieve a sustainable energy transition that's fair to all people a just transition. Secondly, we have to be able to guarantee respect for human rights, despite the fact that corporations are often more powerful actors than countries. Climate change is not just an environmental issue. It's a human rights issue. Think about the right to water, the right to food, the right to life. Climate change is an enormous human rights challenge and rights are already being badly impacted by it around the world. So the transition to sustainable energy is a crucial one for rights. Yet we need to ensure that the move towards a more sustainable planet does not itself negatively impact human rights in developing nations. The impacts of climate change are already falling disproportionately on the poor and the vulnerable who've had least to do with causing the crisis. So where does lithium fit into all this? Lithium ion battery technology is currently a crucial element of the puzzle we need to solve in order to achieve a sustainable transition. These batteries are found in all consumer electronics, your laptop, your phone, but they're also what power electric vehicles. And demand for these vehicles is predicted to soar by a factor of 30 over the next decade alone. On a larger scale, lithium ion battery technology is also our best current means of storage of renewable energy. You may remember the installation that Elon Musk built for the South Australian government a few years back. That's an example of the potential of this technology at grid scale. So lithium ion battery technology is currently very important for prevention of the worst impacts. We could therefore almost say that it's got positive potential for human rights. But there's also a worrying series of negative impacts associated with extraction of minerals for this technology. It's ranged from highly polluting nickel mines in the Philippines, child labour and cobalt extraction in the DR Congo, to appalling conditions in graphite factories in China. However, 
as I mentioned, my research zooms in on one ingredient of these batteries, lithium itself. In the lithium triangle, lithium is extracted from under those vast salt flats that I mentioned earlier. Wells are dug and vast quantities of brine are pumped up onto the surface where the water evaporates off in these huge swimming pool-like tanks. Now in this arid region, which includes some of the driest places on Earth, the impact on the freshwater table is little known. Indigenous communities are deeply concerned about the impact on their drinking water, on their crops, and on the land where their llamas and alpacas graze. They also complain that their indigenous rights to consultation and free prior and informed consent are not being respected when extractive permits are being granted. So in 2019, I hoisted on the old backpack again and headed over to the Lithium Triangle to do some deep research into this issue. I interviewed people from all sides, indigenous communities, companies, government, NGOs, industry experts, and it was far from a black and white picture. Some lithium companies are doing a pretty good job sharing benefits and trying to make a positive and lasting contribution in their engagement with indigenous communities there. Some others, not so much. I heard many different opinions from indigenous leaders, but concern for the water was everywhere. In this driest of places, water's got a huge value, not just practically, but also symbolically and culturally. One leader said to me, as we chewed the coca leaves that helped combat the altitude, we haven't caused this climate crisis. The West can have their sustainable transition, but not at the expense of our livelihoods and culture. And he's right. They've been living there sustainably for thousands of years. And this is where the second of my big questions for the 21st century come in. Companies can have a huge effect on human rights, negative, but also positive. And in fact, of the 100 largest economic entities by revenue in the world, over two thirds of those are companies and not countries. It just shows you how powerful they are in today's world. But human rights law is aimed at countries rather than companies. So there's a gap here, and this is the gap that the field of business and human rights is seeking to address. It's an intriguing space to be working in, because whereas traditional human rights activism involves lobbying of government, with companies, you've got a range of pressure points, of influence points where leverage can be applied. These range from government mandating certain standards by regulation, to community pressure via activism or shareholder motions increasingly. Lenders and stock markets are increasingly mandating particular requirements. Industry frameworks are setting standards. So what works? It's a complex interaction of factors, but I'm going to talk today about one key factor, the supply chain. It's what links us as consumers with those indigenous communities who told me their story. Now, your average lithium company, by the standards of global mining, isn't huge. It doesn't have a global reputation to maintain. You could say that they're not really vulnerable to public opinion. They haven't really needed to be seen as sustainable. But the company that ends up with the lithium in their batteries might be very vulnerable to public opinion indeed. For example, electric vehicles are purchased by consumers for ethical reasons. So it's crucial for those products to be seen as sustainable in the market. And any association with human rights violations in the extraction of lithium for these batteries that go into the vehicles could be a PR disaster for the car manufacturer. So what's happening is that these companies, electric vehicle manufacturers, battery makers, electronics companies, are putting pressure up the supply chain onto the lithium mining companies to guarantee a product that's sustainable on both environmental and social grounds. So these mining companies are being forced by their customers and by customers of their customers 
to improve their performance on these issues. If they don't, and this is already happening, the lithium will get procured preferentially from those companies that do have good policies and community relations in place and can show that their extraction seeks to minimise the negatives and maximise the positive impacts. Because it's about reputation, this supply chain pressure exerted by these electric vehicle companies, the electronics companies, it's actually indirect consumer pressure. It comes from us. And there's a long way to go, but it's heartening, I think, that uh, consumers who care about rights can have this potential leverage on some of the world's biggest companies. Yet the heroes of this tale are the communities themselves who've organised and fought very effectively to transmit their story to a global audience, thereby creating the conditions for this consumer pressure to be felt by these big companies who then apply it along the supply chain to the lithium mining companies and we then get an improvement in rights outcomes on the ground in the lithium triangle. So my key point today is that globalisation can work both ways. The needs of the major economies can have a devastating impact on rights across the other side of the globe. But spirited insistence on those rights by Indigenous communities, facilitated by an interconnected world and consumers that care about rights, can have a tangible effect on some of the world's biggest companies who then apply this supply chain pressure up the line. The 21st century can be daunting. Climate change appears too big. Corporations are too powerful for us to be able to take effective action. But some of those levers of power are within our grasp. We're all consumers. Most of us are superannuation fund members. Many of us are shareholders. Used effectively, these levers can send a powerful message reverberating along supply chains. A message saying that we demand a sustainable transition, but we also demand that it is achieved sustainably. We cannot allow the drive for a renewable energy future to become a green painted altar of progress upon which indigenous cultures and unique ecosystems are sacrificed. If we look at weeds through a scientific lens, you'll find that the most successful ones are those that grow quickly, reproduce early, and compete fiercely. You'll find this is true for those that have been displaced by climate change, but overcome it by moving pole wood. Their fast life history strategies and resistance to the effects of warmer temperatures allow them to keep up with the quick pace of climate change.